I realized they had about 10 or 12 seconds left to live if they didn't do something. During my stay in Hawaii, we were flying P-40s, and time came to upgrade. We switched to P-47s, some of the early models. While uh, being told about the aircraft, we were also cautioned that it was so fast and so heavy that it was almost impossible to make a split S even up to 40,000 feet. The plane would build up too much speed and you'd never be able to complete the half loop. Uh, What's a split S again? A split S is when you're you're cruising along, you roll over on your back and pull her through completely until you're flying in the opposite direction. And uh, they just didn't feel there was enough sky. So this particular day, we I had about, at the time I had about 10 or 15 hours in the plane. And I learned to like it, but had a few faults. At any rate, we took off and headed out to sea. I was flying number two in a four-ship formation. As we started climbing higher and higher past the 35,000-foot mark, I couldn't help but thinking that maybe the flight leader was going to try out the split S routine. And as it turned out, that's exactly what he was doing. But I'd never been up to 40,000 before. As I got up there, got up to 40, 41,000, I noticed the sky darkening. Didn't know whether, whether it was me psychologically or whether it really happened. Since then, I found out it does happen. The sky appears darker. You have less filtering. At any rate, he pulled over in a wing over, which is a pull up and a roll over going down uh, partially on your back and then pull it through. Naturally, with the uh, superchargers, the crude superchargers we had, I lost distance, but I was within about 150 feet of them as we went down. The second element, that's the next two ships coming up, went further out of, uh, out of position and probably saved their lives by doing it. But anyway, we started down, and I was in position, and that plane started building up speed pretty rapidly. And just before we got down to vertical, to the vertical dive phase, I guess the flight leader changed his mind, and he rolled over to a right side up so we're in a standard dive. And naturally I rolled with him. But I noticed that the plane... In a few sec, uh, in a matter of seconds, the nose kept dropping steeper and steeper. I started to, to try to control it, and found I had no control. The plane was in a compressibility dive. That's where the air in front of your wing, rather than flowing smoothly over it, is built up into a cushion, and the air is the turbulent air is thrown too far away to hit your control surfaces. I noticed that my uh, altimeter was spinning like a top, and it was just hitting at about the 15,000 feet, and at 15,000 feet, I knew that it, it operates like a barometer, and I, I realized that I could very well be at 14 and 13, five. And my needle was pegged at 550, and if you figure a 2% error per 1,000 feet, that means I was going 30% over 550 or over 750 miles an hour, maybe even 850. There was no way of knowing. And I realized I had about 10 or 12 seconds left to live if I didn't do something. So I immediately hit full throttle and water injection. The P-47 came with water injection so that when you use full war emergency power, 
You were using all that raw gas, and the detonation could blow the engine if you didn't cool it down with water vapor right within the uh, combustion chamber. And the moment I did that, I noticed a puff of black smoke come out of my flight leader's tail, indicating that he did the same thing. I started pulling back on the stick, and I started getting control immediately. And as I kept pulling back on the stick, I mean, uh, I could feel myself going toward blackout. Uh, a blackout is when you've got too many G's pulling down on you. The blood, the blood just can't get up to your head. So the only thing you can do is tighten up your stomach muscles, your arm muscles, neck muscles, maybe even scream out loud just to keep keep those muscles tense to keep the blood from draining out. And I started to, uh, I tensed up all my muscles started pulling her out of the dive. A uh, weird thought came into my mind. Gee, I pulled the wings off. And I said, what the hell is the difference? You ain't going to live another eight or ten seconds anyhow. Uh, so I kept her going, and I kept myself just at the point of red out, not quite black out. After you've done it 20 or 30 times, you can almost feel it. And it's a gamble, but you have to feel it. You have to pull in other words, I was using the plane to the maximum that I could and still stay awake. And I could notice the waves rushing by as as my nose was sweeping toward coming up to the to the uh, horizontal. I I did look at the speedometer after that. I just kept concentrating on keeping everything t as tense as I could, arms, legs, throat. And as I started pulling her up, finally I noticed and through the dim haze of the red out, I noticed that my nose was coming up to the horizon. And as she passed above the horizon, I was probably still going down from the force of that uh, eight and a half, nine ton airplane you know, sinking uh, uh, toward the ground, seven and a half tons, I should say. I realized that it should just be a matter of seconds, and I'll know if I could make it. And finally, my nose was almost completely above the horizon, and I noticed that the needle, the altimeter needle, which had been spinning almost out of control, suddenly slowing down, and as it got to about somewhere between 300 and 500 feet, she dipped, wavered, and started going back up. So I immediately zoomed, chopped my throttle, zoomed up to about four or five thousand feet, did a hammerhead, a hammerhead turn, which is turnover on one wing, to look down to see if everybody else was alive. Well, of course, the second element was still above. And I noticed the flight leader was down. He didn't zoom up on his pull out as high as I did. So I dropped my nose. We all joined up, and we went back, and we landed. He never spoke about it, never said a word, never gave him any indication of what had happened. Uh, he went and sat at a table that was already loaded with people, so I couldn't sit down and talk to him about what he did. I felt... He didn't want to do it. He almost killed four people, and he just didn't want to talk about it. And uh, that's my experience with a P-47. However, about 12 years later, I was selling cars for courtesy, and a customer came in, and on his credit statement, he told me he, worked, he had worked for Republic during the war. And I said, what were you? He says, an engineer. So I told him about this experience, and he said, Oh, he said, sir, you did it wrong. That is not the way to recover. And I asked him how many hours he, he had as pilot. He said, well, none. I said, uh, well, if, 
if I did if I did the wrong, I made the wrong choice and it worked out all right. Let's say that it turned out okay. That's the story of my P47 in the compressibility dive. I think it was the first time you told me this. You said that you were headed down. You had just a couple of seconds to go and you didn't know what to do, but you went counterintuitively and you accelerated the plane rather than trying to slow well, it down. Yes, I went full full yeah. throttle. I wasn't looking for acceleration. I was looking for a blast of air that would go over the control surfaces and give me some control. Because uh, if you look at any wing, no matter how aerodynamic, at some point or other, as it's pushing through that air, if there's a little bit of a bluntness, and the Davis wing was blunt by today's standards, uh, Davis wing is the type of wing that was on that plane, I believe. At any rate, you build up a cushion in front rather than it just splitting. It, it's, it's a little too heavy. It's like taking a dull knife and trying to cut through bread. You pull chunks with it. Your, your, your force will cut you through it, but you're pulling chunks out of it. Well, that's what it's doing. And that cushion over there, the air in front of it, as, as she goes over, she doesn't go over in a smooth flow. So as a consequence, your airplane is technically in a stall. You could be going 800 miles an hour, but your airplane is stalled in the sense that you have no control over it. In other words, your control surfaces don't reach into that smooth stream. But it was just counterintuitive, the idea of accelerating the plane at that point. Yeah, I felt I had to put some air across the control surfaces. Yeah. It's instinctive. I, I don't even know that I thought of that uh -huh. in, in terms of just the way you put it. Gee, I must get some air over there. Uh, my first thought was, let me get, let me hit full throttle. And uh, the purpose of hitting full throttle was to get control. Sure. While in the Philippines, we had a mission. I was stationed in Lingayen, and that's on the island of Luzon. Uh, we had a mission up near, it was near the end of the campaign of the war when um, the Japanese troops were fighting a slow retreat, making us fight for just about every foot of land up in the northern parts of um, Luzon. And we had perfected pretty well the art of close, uh, close support for ground troops come in and, and hit them with machine guns or bombs or fire bombs or whatever the case may be. And at this particular time, we had a mission, I think it was a 12, I think it was a 12 ship mission, and we had fire bombs. And the idea was to turn ourselves over to ground control in that particular area, who would be uh, a member of the of the fighting, of the ground fighting force, and he would know exactly where he needed the assistance and where the holdups were for his ground troops. Well, we had all gone in and we were in a basin of mountains with little ridges and other hillets, um, extremely dangerous flying conditions. Maybe in good weather it might have been a little bit better, but anytime you're dive bombing, uh, bombing into mountains or even skip bombing, whatever, uh, you're always taking a chance because you're flying from ridge to ridge, from peak to to low point. Well, this particular time, uh, they sent in the first four ships on one target, then they sent the next four ships on an another target, and then they picked another target for us. It was a ridge. There was a long pathway leading up to this ridge. The ridge could have been possibly 20 feet, 25 feet wide at one point, but it was dominated by a, a gun position, multiple, you know, 50 caliber machine guns. And there was no infantry going to come up that, those slopes because on the, the two sides were just too steep for anybody to climb without mountain climbing equipment, and you got the enemy looking right down at you, 
and the other slope, even though they could come up of it, was dominated by the guns. So our target was that particular machine gun nest. Well, the first three went in, and while they hit near it, uh, it, it was pinpoint, and you just can't always pinpoint when you're level bombing in that type of terrain. I was out of position and couldn't make my run because one of the other boys, when he had turned, had turned the wrong way, which uh, has set off our whole timing. So I told him, I said, I'm not just dropping the bomb, I, you know, I'm going around. He said, well, go around and drop it. So I came around single-handedly while the flights were joining up above. And I came down and I figured there's only one way to get them. I'm going to come in under the ridge and hope to lift the bomb up a little as I dropped it. And if it hit short, it would hit on the side of the hill. I'd be aiming directly at the gun nest. Uh, it would be directly beneath the, the, gun, uh, the machine gun nest. And the flames of 165 gallons of napalm was going to get to them in some way. Well, as it turned out, I came in and, and as I, I was maybe 15 feet, 10, 15 feet below the, uh, the ridge when I decided to drop the bomb and at the same moment uh, yank back on the stick to give that little bit of lift to sail it into instead of just going down and just about the time I went across the top of the machine gun nest I could feel the blast of as you know of those 165 gallons of napalm igniting you can feel it and I heard control say wow and I turned around and take a look and I can't see the nest it just he, and I called control and said, what happened? He says, you dropped it right in their lap. <laughs> now, uh, I can't take credit for saying I planned it that way, but it's nice to know that once in a while, when you try to do something a little unorthodox, it works. So that was one good spot. There was one time when you uh, said that your flight leader told you to drop a bomb on these people running across the field. Yeah, that uh, that was uh, a commanding officer that, for some reason or other, he and I just didn't get along. And uh, we had gone in to bomb this village near Tugui Garao, I think was the name of it. And as the other guys went in, they started bombing the village, and I could see all these people running out. Again, we had napalm. And when I came down for my run, I could notice these people were looking up and waving. I can see they're Filipinos. I'm only 20 feet off the ground. I mean, I can see the Filipinos and their children. Some of the children were with them. Some were carrying, you know, little ones. And the women and children did not... You would never see the Filipino women and children anywhere with the Jap troops. They may capture them and use them for whatever purpose, but they just didn't mingle like that. And I just felt that this was the villagers and the Japs were gone. So I went, I didn't drop my bomb. He said, why didn't you drop your bomb? I said, they're civilians. And he says, I told you to drop your bomb, now drop your bomb on them. So I figured, well, okay, I'm going to come around. So I came around and I waited until I was at the leading edge. They were running toward a grove of trees. Uh, about by this time it was only 150 yards or so away so I got down there real close maybe 20 feet above the ground 30 feet something like that and I waited till I could see the last of them over the edge of my wing then again I used the same trick hit you know hit the release yank back on the stick at the same time and you're airplane is starting to move upward and naturally your bomb has some of that upward movement as it goes over and I sailed it off into the middle of the grove of trees so he cussed at me and said what the hell did you do I said I don't know I, I bomb hung up what, what do you want from me and uh, he knew 
he knew exactly what happened, but there's nothing he could say. Um, and uh, but there's no way I was going to buy women and children. Yeah. It wasn't in my contract. <laughs> Son of, son of a bitch just died about four months.